I did a video and I said I just would like several email several emails that were on topic the ones that weren't trying to impose a view but actually were explaining the point I left them up the ones who were actually saying they already knew that information I left that up but the ones who were off topic or like I said promoting a particular view I took those comments and I just deleted them uh, because I am very specific and I really am a stickler for following instructions so this person wrote I'm not gonna show no names there are two groups the 144,000 are the first fruits okay the 144,000 are the first fruits uh, Paul says it Jesus says it Jesus says that he himself was the first <coughs> fruit the first one to be resurrected to the heavens as a spirit creature the very first that's why it's called the first fruit okay it's it's okay I know you all knew that however this individual says Exodus speaks about the barley harvest that has nothing to do with these are not those type of fruits even when Jesus said it, he wasn't talking about those fruits he mentioned about individuals being pay attention known by their fruits he wasn't talking about the barley harvest this had nothing to do with the harvest now but no 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 but he did talk about the harvest yes but not when he mentioned about the first fruits referencing those who were going to be a part of that group who would rule with Christ and his father for a thousand years okay watch this hold on and that's what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about just this response right here that's it nothing else I'm not going to talk about anything else anything else everything else we'll talk about another time in another video there's a video coming up but not this video hold on first now you guys are gonna have to bear with me because I am mentally <laughs> that's for right for right for right yeah that's that's what I was about to say about bearing with me I am mentally exhausted please understand that is not a gimmick or a joke I'm gonna go to the encyclopedia first fruit um, you see it says 11 cakes then he talks about Hezekiah neither one of those will be our subject you know what I I should put in I am the first fruit but uh, see first fruit offerings that was in regards to sacrifices however I am hmm, prophetic patterns not looking for that because that's not the subject matter uh, I'm putting first fruits of those and okay I'm looking for the actual scripture but this is gonna take not going to heaven in expression of thanks okay I'm, I'm not I just want the first fruit part okay they will be earthly subjects of the heavenly rule of Christ and his 144,000 king priests no problem can handle that that's what we read in that video however I'm looking for where Christ said he was the first fruit of those and nah no I, I have to do now see this is the problem because I don't know the exacto scripture I have to do this C H R I S T okay the fact that we're talking about first fruits and Christ actually mentions that he is the first fruit of those fallen who have fallen asleep this is what Paul says in first Corinthians the 15th chapter I like I said I am tired I should have known that because this is the whole analogy 
of death and him explaining what they're meaning by death. It's Paul, uh, if Jesus is the first fruit, this is not the wheat harvest, and pay attention. Let's show you what the comment said. The comment said, it goes back to Exodus. Okay. Males two years old who were killed in Egypt, thrown into the river, John the Baptist. No wife is 144,000. When it says they're virgins, it's spiritually speaking. It is not speaking literal. Peter had a wife. He had three daughters. So it's not literal. It's not talking about literal virgins. Many of you may not know what I'm speaking about, but I understand where this individual is coming from because in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter, verse 1 through 5, it says that the 144,000 are virgins. They're not physical virgins. Okay? Many of them were married. You don't believe me? Go back and look at the book of Corinthians. Even look at the part where John talks about how a husband and a wife are to be involved and how they, members of those congregations at that time, had this hope of being in that number. All of you know about the 144,000, whether you believe it or not. Listen to the song, Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, how I hope to be in that number when the saints go marching in. That's what it's all about. I didn't make it up. That song was around way before I came into existence. But people have known about that number all this time. So not focusing on the number, he brought up first fruits. Sorry, I'm installing Adobe in my background. So go ahead and get rid of that for now because it has a little glitch. Now, it says after the barley harvest, 50 days after the Passover, is the Pentecost. That's the Pentecost. The most significant Pentecost was Pentecost 33 CE. The 50 days after Jesus' death. Okay. 50 days after his death, they had what was known as Pentecost 33 CE. That is the book of Acts. You'll see that starting beginning roughly about the second chapter on through the fourth chapter <clears throat> is Pentecost 33 CE. <clears throat> Excuse me. Clearing my throat for real this time. Genesis 1, uh, 4152 says... And the name of the second shall be called Ephraim. I mentioned Ephraim, and yeah, did, you didn't say Ephraim? No, I said Ephraim. F, uh, 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 Ephraim. Not Ephraim. Ephraim is an English pronunciation. Ephraim, and most people who are of Hispanic Latin origin, understands the word Ephraim. They know how to pronounce it correctly. Ephraim. Now, Hold on. We're going to go to Genesis. Uh, like I said, we've already gotten the point. Well, you know what? I didn't show it to you. So let's show that to you so that we can get the point. Because I mentioned all publications. And we go back and back and back and back. All right. No, because it's still looking for that one occurrence. So first fruit. We're going to go to Paul's communication. And we're going to get rid of that. We're going to do all publications. And we're going to go here. And we're going to go all the way down to 1 Corinthians 15. And by going to 1 Corinthians 15... There are going to be several scriptures here that's going to talk about first fruit. Okay, but we know that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. All Paul is doing, and that's all I'm doing, is explaining about the scriptures. Pay attention. According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. I'm not going, he has asked, we have been warned. Do not go beyond scripture. You know, I do need to speak, and I, I just need for you all to understand. He speaks about those who have fallen asleep in death. So they're still asleep. They're still in the grave. That's why they get a resurrection. They wake up. Okay? Now, he speaks about those who are worthy of being called and those... He says that about himself, I am not worthy of being called an apostle. Not just an apostle, because an apostle is a sent one. That's what the word apostle means. But being called 
being of the chosen, being of the few. He's not worthy, he says. Why? Because he persecuted the congregation. Even though he talks about all the things he did, he still had the opinion of himself that he still did not measure up, even though he did more than any and every one of them. Now, if we're being preached that Christ has been raised up from the dead, how is it that some of you are saying that the, there is no resurrection of the dead? For if indeed there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised up. And if Christ has not been raised up, we are of the most to be pitied on this planet. Because everything we talk about is in vain, is what he says. See, if we've given witness that Christ has been raised from the dead, that he was resurrected, but he did not get raised up from the dead, then, again, we are most to be pitied, he says. Now, let's talk about the first fruit. But now Christ has been raised up from the dead, the first fruit. So John the Baptist died before Christ. The individual who wrote this, he spoke about John the Baptist being the first. John the Baptist was not part of the 144,000 because he died before Christ. Christ was, pay attention to the wording, because that's important. But now that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit, the first one to be raised from the dead to spirit life, not as a fleshly person, okay? The first one to be raised from the dead of those fallen asleep in death, for since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. So nobody was resurrected to actual real life, I know Lazarus, the widow and the mother who had the son bereaving about her son, those individuals were resurrected, but they eventually died. Jesus talked about a resurrection to life, not a resurrection to death. Okay, now remember death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire? Pay attention. And the last enemy, death, is to be brought to nothing. Okay, now hold on. You also know, those of you who've read this, he must rule as king, Christ Jesus, until God has put all enemies under his feet. And when the last enemy, death, has been brought to nothing, he, Jesus, surrenders all things to his father. That's what it says. Okay, we all know this, right? Fine. <sighs> so grateful. Now let's get back to the point. Oh, there's a point? You better believe it. So it's not talking about the wheat harvest with reference to Pentecost. It just so happens that the choosing of these individuals happened on that day because they were all required. This was one of the three yearly festivals. You had the festival of the booth, the festival of the gathering or Pentecost, and the festival of the unleavened bread, the Passover. Those were the three festivals, the Jews, their holidays, that they celebrated. They were required to celebrate those holidays. Three holidays that the Jews, the original Jews, were required to celebrate. It was a mandate. It was the law. So Jesus told them, hey, don't leave Jerusalem until the thing that I promised, the promised helper, arrives. Then you will be witnesses of me in all of Judea and Jerusalem and to the most distant parts of the earth. And in Samaria too. Okay? Whew. Glad we got that off our chest. Now, let's talk about Ephraim. As I mentioned. Because this is necessary. Because what I'm saying is I asked for someone to disprove the information. So, I don't know if he said they are my sons or they are mine. Okay? I, again, I don't know if Jacob said they are my sons or they belong to me. But we're in Genesis and Joseph recognized his brothers. They did not recognize him. So we're in the right spot now. You got the right one, baby. We're in the right spot. And you know... I forgot how to 
get to the next spot on here. It's been a while since I've used this this way. Oh, that's right. We got to go further down because this is after Jacob. Uh, they go and they get Jacob. Uh, his brother Benjamin. No. Oh, that's right. We're going towards the end. Hold on. Hold on. Now, pay attention. Israel is Jacob. Okay, that's who Israel was. That's why he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and asked, who are these? Now, he was blind, ladies and gentlemen. He could not see. His vision had failed him. So, understand what's going on. So, Joseph said to his father, now, he had been in Egypt for a while. He's seen these children before. But this is a special occasion. Notice what Joseph said. They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And at this he said, bring them to me, please, so that I may bless them. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, do you guys understand what went on? Joseph brought his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to Jacob. For him to bless his children because this was the practice of the patriarchs back then. Now the eyes of Israel were failing from age. Yeah, he was going blind and he was unable to see. He was going blind. So I'm not telling you anything that's not already in front of you. Again, I'm not going to go from what's in front of us. This is not about no religion. It's about what the scriptures say. Now, again, there was a guy who quoted, commented, and stated that the, all of the Bible is analogies. They're like allegory. What the? First of all, scientists have already proven that the flood happened. Historical records already proved that Abraham existed. Already proved... Pay attention, because this is important, that Daniel existed. <sighs> Already proved that there was a king, Pharaoh, Nerco, and Nero, and all of the other leaders like Nebuchadnezzar and Belteshazzar. At first, they said that Belteshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, did not exist. That he was a figment. And then they went and discovered unearth evidence of his existence. We know that King Sennacherib exists because there is history of Sennacherib, an Assyrian king. All of the events in the Bible, people have been trying to disprove the Bible's, pay attention to this word, canonicity. The Bible canon. They have been trying to disprove it for years. Only with words. Scientific discovery has proven that everything that's written in there, the historical aspects of it, actually happen. So that argument <sighs> proves nothing because it's just a statement. It's not proof. For instance, how can we prove there's a flood? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, you're right there. Because they said that global warming, if all of the ice melts, it's going to flood the entire earth. Oh, so you know about the fact that when the water was, there used to be a blanket of water above the earth. That's the firmament above. There was a blanket of water that covered the earth, sort of like a insulation that kept the temperatures pretty temporal throughout the year. No harsh winters, no harsh summers. And then he let that water drop. Let it drop. And next thing you know. The parts of the earth that was furthest away from the sun, that got the less sunlight, well, the temperature dropped so drastically that it was instantaneous freezing. Wait, are you saying that's what they call the Ice Age? I'm saying that's exactly what they're referring to the Ice Age at. But what they did not tell anyone is that there was no Ice Age in northern South America. Or in Mexico. No evidence of ever an ice age. Ladies and gentlemen, to prove that there was a flood, <laughs> I don't need scientists. I was in New Mexico. Now, this is a unique thing. The land I bought in New Mexico was the same amount of land I bought here. And in New Mexico, I had to dig and dig and dig because we were planting and gardening and 
building. But every time I dug, I was hitting rocks. Well, the reason why I was hitting rocks is because what happened when they were trying to displace the Indians, the so-called white men would literally put rocks into the soil so that individuals couldn't grow anything. So I'm hitting rock after rock after rock after rock while just digging and posting poles in the ground. But then I'm also noticing I'm hitting seashells. And I literally go, what are seashells doing 5,300 feet elevation? 5,300 feet above sea level. What are seashells doing all the way up here? Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you have seashells on top of mountains where there is no sea because there was a worldwide flood. So when people say that the events of the Bible did not happen, they don't support it with any proof, even though scientists prove it all the time. So let's get back to Ephraim because Ephraim is very important. Now we know that Jacob's eyes were dimming. So Joseph brought them close, both his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he kissed them and embraced them, meaning Israel or Jacob kissed his grandchildren. Now these are not little kids. A lot of people think these are, these are grown men. Okay, these are grown men. They are not five and six year olds. They're not 16, 17 year olds. They're in their 20s. How do we know this? <sighs> because... Jacob, I mean, excuse me, Joseph was 17 years old when he was taken to Egypt as a slave. He spent at least almost 12 years in prison being accused of something he did not do. There was a seven-year period of, what do you call that, plenty, and a seven-year period period of famine 14 years now hold on Joseph's or Joseph's children would be born within that period of plenty why because that's when he was married Jacob has already been in is I mean in Egypt for quite some time to the point where he got to see everything that was going on and got to be old and got to be satisfied. We know that he spent more than 20 years, just do the math, it tells you his age, 20 years in Egypt. Well, how did people live so long back then? Because they were closer to the originals. Because the originals lived longer. You see it all the time. It, the, the same scientific theory that is always brought up. You take a pan, it has a dent in it, and every single loaf of bread you put in that pan will come out and it'll all have a dent. Well, when you take a piece of paper and you put it through a copy machine and you keep making copies of that piece of paper, eventually it gets degraded. That's the same thing with humans. The longer we go on, the, the more degraded we get. Haven't you noticed people and haven't you noticed that people are not flying on all cylinders so because they were closer to the original they lived longer we have some people today I just read a report about a guy who's 109 years old and they were talking about what he had to suggest as to why he lived so long there are people in certain Asian countries who are in their hundreds and everybody talks about the fountain of youth because of that so that's the reason but never mind Jacob said to Joseph, I never imagined I would see your face, but here God has let me see your offspring. And I'm going to, um, your seed. Joseph then removed them from Israel's knees, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, the children weren't sitting on Israel's knees. Let me promise you, they were too big. And he was too old. I, I promise you, he was old and big, and he had picked up a lot of weight. So they weren't going to be sitting on his knees. So it's not a literal, he removed them from his knees. 
if you go back and look at Isaac and his father Abraham, you'll see that um, Eleazar, Abraham's servant, was told to place his hand underneath Abraham's thigh. So this could be a reference to a similar type of performance ceremony or ritual. But notice what the ritual is right now. Joseph now took the two of them, Ephraim, in his right hand and Israel's left hand and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim, um, says, with his left hand on Israel's right. So basically, Jacob's got his hands crossed and he brought them close to him. However, Israel put out his right hand and placed it on Ephraim's head. The right hand is that 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 righteous power, the one, hey, I'm approving, that's that hand. Although he was the younger, he placed his left hand on Manasseh's head. He purposely laid his hand this way, since Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, the true God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the true God who has been shepherding me all my life until this day, the angel who has been recovering me from all of my calamity, bless these boys. Let my name be called upon them and the name of my father Abraham and Isaac and let them increase to a multitude in the earth. And Joseph saw that his father had kept his right hand placed on Ephraim's head, and this displeased him. What are you doing, father? Stop that! I'm sorry. So he tried to take hold of his father. Give me get your hand! Oh, get, no, no. Okay? He tried to take his hand and move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Now Joseph said to his father, No, not so, my father, because this is the firstborn. Put your hand on his head. But his father kept refusing and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He too will become a people. He too will become great. But nevertheless, his younger brother will become greater than he will. And his offspring will become the full equivalent of nations. And so he continued to bless them on that day, saying, Let Israel mention you when they pronounce blessings, saying, May the God make you like Ephraim and like Manasseh. And he kept putting Ephraim ahead or before Manasseh. Now Israel said to Joseph, Look, I am dying, but God will certainly continue with you and return you to the land of your forefathers. That's for me. I give a special portion to you. Okay? Now, hold on one second. Gotta go do something. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, also, we are in the 47th chapter of Genesis 47, 48, and 49. That's where you're going to find this information. What I want to explain to you is when I said they were at least 20 years old, here is your proof that they were at least 20 years old. We're going to go, I think it is the 16th chapter or the beginning of the 17th chapter that explains it. But you're going to get it, you're going to see it, and it's going to be right there in front of you. Where is my... Uh-oh... Excuse me. I'm looking for... I probably already passed it because I know it ain't this far back. Yeah, I went too far back. It is... Yeah, that's what it was. Okay, I went, I went too far back. So we're looking for... The part where... There it is right there. And Jacob, Israel, lived on in the land of Egypt for 17 years. So remember, there was a famine. But before there was a famine, there were seven years of plenty. Pharaoh gave his daughter to... Uh, now, uh, Zephaneth Paneah. That was the name he gave to jo uh, Joseph. Zephaneth Paneah. So everybody went to Zephaneth Paneah, Joseph, and... He gave Joseph his wife, as his daughter as a wife. So when he gave Joseph his daughter as a wife, 
understand that they had relations and had children. That's how we have Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, this was, let's give them at least two years. Let's just say he waited two years to have children. Okay, that means there was five more years of the plenty and seven more years of famine. Now, Jacob came into the land a couple of years into the famine. So let's say the children are at least six, seven years old. Now, Jacob lives in the land for 17 more years. Okay, he lived 147 years. We have people who have lived to at least 118 in our time, so it is not unreasonable that somebody could live to 140. Sorry, it's just, it's not unreasonable. Yes, I, it's unusual, but the fact is somebody living to 115, 112, 111, but it's reported on the news all the time. Okay, but the years are decreasing. We get that information all the time. All right, so the children were not kids. They were not five-year-olds. They were not seven-year-olds. So like I said, these are grown men sitting on his knee. Uh-uh, ain't happening. The man's 147 years. Come on now, ain't happening. All right. Now, let's go back to the part about the sons. Okay. It says, they told Joseph, they say, look, your father is getting weak. So now he's about to die. So Joseph came to him and he gathered all the children and he started telling the children exactly what they will become. Now, notice what he says. Now, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came, again, they were born before he came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will become mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Ah, it's interesting that he mentions Reuben, uh, Reuben right? But the children to you after them will become yours again why would he prophesy that yes jacob was a prophet sorry you didn't know go back and reread okay he even tells the children what's going to happen he even tells them how long they're going to be in captivity so yes he was a prophet now let's get back to this he said jacob sons were his now, sometime after that conversation, he says, who are these? He says, these are my sons, which we just read. So when I speak to you about Ephraim and Nasa, the reason for that, if you go back and you read about his speaking of Reuben, because he speaks of Reuben. Hold on, where are you at, Reuben? He speaks of Reuben, and he doesn't speak of him in a good light. He speaks of what Reuben did. And he wasn't pleased with it. And his brothers weren't pleased with it either. So he calls his son says, Gather yourselves together and I will tell you what will happen to you in the final part of the day. Is again a prophet. Assemble yourselves and listen, you sons of Jacob or Israel. Yes, listen to Israel, your father. So now you see where Jacob and Israel are the same person. Again, everything I'm saying is from here. It's not from my head. It's not from root or memory. It's from here. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my vigor, the beginning of my productive power, the excellence of dignity and the excellence of strength. You're the firstborn. You, you, you first. Ain't nobody coming ahead of you. With reckless and turbulent waters, you have not excelled. Or excuse me, you will not excel. <coughs> Sorry. He said Reuben was reckless. And like turbulent waters, uncontrolled says so you're not going to excel you will not benefit you will not achieve it says but you have gone up into your father's bed at that time you defiled my bed he actually went on to it why would he sleep with his father's wife why that's how he lost the right of firstborn and as far as simeon and levi Look, somebody made a comment that Simeon and Levi, because they went to Shechem, and Dinah, their sister, had been raped, but then later decided that she had the Stockholm Syndrome and wanted to uh, Shechem. I forgot what the gentleman's name was, because he didn't live that long. 
I mean, he got circumcised and he died during his recovery period. But he talks about their anger being great because it is cruel and their fury because it is harsh. Let me disperse them in Jacob and let me scatter them in Israel. And you'll find out that they were dispersed. Levi was all over Israel because they didn't have any inheritance. And Simeon, Simeon had a lot of problems as a tribe of Israel. So, now let's get back to the gentleman's comment. The reason why I'm doing this is because there were certain points brought up. So he said, the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He's associating this fruitful with the first fruit. I'm sorry, not the same thing. This saying fruitful is not the same fruitful as what was referenced by Jesus being the first fruit. Okay? Okay, hold on. We went to Corinthians and we saw that Jesus was the first fruit of those redeemed from the earth. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of these are my two sons. You know what? There was a show called My Two Sons, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, my bad. I wonder if it was taken from this. You never, you never know. Uh, because it was called My Two Sons. These are my two sons. Okay. Uh, no, we can't do that. So it won't let me. It's got the, uh, the occurrences up here. And that's what I don't need. So let's see if we can clear that. Like I said, I've used it. Clear search history. There you go. Whew. All right. Now let's go up and let's go all publications. We're going to go Biblia and we're going to go Revelation and we're going to go 14. So that you will understand who these fruits are. So again, it's not me. I'm not making this say what it says. It says what it says. So we can go to the 14th chapter so that we'll know what group we're talking about. Let it tell us. Then I saw and look a lamb standing up on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. Same as it said in chapter 7. Oh, by the way, chapter 13, 666. It's a number. It's a mark. And see, it's a mark, it's a name, and it's a number. So it's not literal. It's not a literal 666 number. So stop thinking that. Look. Sell except the person having the mark, the name, or of the wild beast. So it's the name of the beast. The beast is created. It comes from the people. Don't you remember Revelation the 13th chapter verse 1 through 3? Or the number of its name. So the name represents something. The number of its name. It's not literal. It's not, it's not a chip that they're going to infuse in you. This is where it calls for wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody doesn't have wisdom. Because according to the scriptures, this is not manly wisdom. The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God, is what the scriptures say. So this wisdom is not foolish wisdom. This has to be the wisdom spoken of in Proverbs, where it says, wisdom is from Jehovah, Proverbs 1.7. This is where it calls for wisdom. Well, this is a prophecy so, said to be from God, so it has to be his wisdom. His, not yours. Let the one who has insight also coming from God calculate. Uh-oh. So we got to do some arithmetic. The number of the wild beast, for it is a man's number, and the number is six, man created on the sixth day, six denoting imperfection. Okay, do you understand? And it's emphasized by being said three times. So it means that it is a man's number. It's from man. That this mark is a mark of man's creation. It has nothing to do with a chip that they put inside your skin. Because a person can accept, pay attention, that nobody can buy or sell except the person having the mark or the name. You're going to figure it out one day. Might be too late, but you're going to figure it out. Let's get back to this right here. And I saw him look a lamb standing up on Mount Zion. So the lamb is Jesus. The Bible lets us know it is Jesus. Go ahead. I'll put it over there. And there you see. The next day, I saw Jesus coming and said, look, the, the lamb of God. 
that's spoken of in John. That's where you first hear him being called the Lamb of God. Okay? And with him, 144,000 with his name and the name of his father. Oh, look at that. Jesus and his father have two separate names. His name and the name of his father written on their forehead. They don't actually have names written on their forehead when you look at them right there in front of their forehead. Oh, look at that. You got Jesus' name and his father's name right on your forehead. Okay, anyway. It says, and I heard the sound coming from the heavens like the sound of many waters. Again, denoting individuals. And like the sound of loud thunders. And the sound I heard was like that of singers accompanying themselves by playing on their harps. And they are singing what seems to be a new song. See, it seems to be a new song, but it is not new. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to master that song. It didn't say nobody was able to know the song. It said nobody was able to master that song, but the 144,000 who have been bought, purchased, price, bought from the earth. Somebody paid for them. It said these are the ones who did not defile themselves with women. In fact, they are virgins. This is not a literal virgin. As one individual indicated. These are the ones who kept following the Lamb no matter where he goes these were bought from among mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So these first fruits are has nothing to do with anybody prior to Jesus coming to the earth and dying. Anybody who died before Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, none of them are listed as one of these 144,000 first fruits. They cannot. Because Jesus, upon his death and resurrection, was the first of the first fruit. Did we not already cover that in 1 Corinthians? Wait, I don't think I don't think people realize it, so let's go back. 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it is verse 20, if I am not mistaken. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go here. Then we're going to type in 15. Then we're going to go to verse 20. And see if I, my memory is not failing me right tonight. Because my memory has been causing me some problems lately. And Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruit of those who have fallen asleep in death. Interesting. So this whole conversation is about the 144,000 first fruits. That's what he's talking about. That's who he's talking to. I didn't make it up. I'm not saying it. He says it. Go back and read it. For... Since death came through one man, resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. For just as in Adam all are dying, so also in Christ, in Christ, okay? These are the ones who die in Christ, not the ones who just died. Because remember, a lot of people died before Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Go back and look at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the book of faith. The book of faith is the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And go back and look at Sarah. Go back and look at Rahab, Moses, and all of those individuals whom it says were expecting to receive a reward such as this first fruit reward, but did not attain it. They still get their gift of life, but they don't get this gift. Okay? Now, notice what he says. Hold on. Each one in his proper order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, those who belong or who die in Christ, see, the phrase right here, in the Christ, okay, so also, in the Christ, all are being made alive. These die in union with Christ or in Christ, so they're not just everybody and their grandmama. Everybody think, oh, I'm a servant of Christ, that means that includes me. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong or right. I'm telling you that the scriptures say that this is a particular group. But each one in his own proper order. Christ the first fruit and after that, those who belong to Christ during his presence. Not during his second coming. During his presence. Next the end, when he hands over the kingdom to his father and God. Remember, we're told about the kingdom all throughout. Jesus is the king of that kingdom, along with the first fruits. Now, I didn't make this up. That's
That's why I keep asking that question. That's why I presented the questions to you guys. Because my question was, who is these? Who they be? Y'all understand what I'm saying, don't y'all? Watch this. Well, as a matter of fact, I can go back. And I want to thank you all because by working this program now, I am now remembering how to work this program. I use it, but I don't use it like this, like this. Because I don't need to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to prove these things because these are things that I already know by root. All I'm doing is asking for somebody to disprove it. So, now, the individual said the 144,000 was referring to a different group of people. We just learned that it could not be that the first fruit, the first of the first fruit was Jesus. So, it cannot refer to anybody who did not know who Jesus was. That would be impossible. Now, go ahead, let's do this. This I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Now, he's saying it's Ephraim and the wheat harvest, and that's not what it is. It clearly lets us know that this great multitude of individuals who come out of the great tribulation. Wait, hold on. No, hold on. See, again, he, he uses scriptures, and I'm not I'm not faulting that. He uses scriptures, but again, this is, uh, you know what? I know why that's not doing it. Heck, now, but I got to go back to, because of the way I did it. Okay, so... Ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is because he said that the people who are that great multitude, that they equal Ephraim, we're going we're gonna to check out Ephraim and see if this adds up to Ephraim. I didn't mean to go to 10, 7. Okay? So what I went over in the last video, this is the part, talks about the 144,000 again. Okay, and it says, And I saw, and look, a great crowd, which no man was able to number out of all the nations, tribes, people, and tongues, and before the throne, and before the Lamb, dressed in white wolves, and there were palm branches in their hands. These palm branches have nothing to do with a harvest. These palm branches, palm trees, palm branches, throughout all of Israelite history, the temple had lacings of palm branches engraved in gold and other metals, Throughout the temple of Israel, throughout the tabernacle, that was the pattern that Moses was told to make those things. Palm branches signify peace. Remember, Jerusalem was, a first, was first identified by a bunch of palm trees. Jerusalem stands for... Anybody? Jeru? Jeru? King, Salem, peace, king of peace, Jerusalem. That's why it was denoted for its palm trees. Okay, now I asked who was this group. This person says it's Ephraim and the wheat class. Now, partly true about the wheat class because Jesus mentions about the wheat class. That the scriptures agree. But the thing about Ephraim, it is impossible for that to be the case because this doesn't talk about people in the past. This is my Lord. You are the one that knows. Because he asked them, who are they and where they come from? I'm asking the same question. Who are they and where they come from? He said to me, these are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation. Not out of the grave. Out of the Great Tribulation. The thing that Jesus promised was going to happen. Watch. We're going to go there. Let's take a look. Matthews 24, 21, and 22. Didn't go there the last time. It says, keep praying that your flight does not occur in the wintertime or on a Sabbath day. For then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the world's beginning until now. No, nor will occur again. In fact, unless those days were cut short, unless those days were cut short so the days will be cut short, no flesh would be saved. But if those days are not cut short, no one would survive. There are almost 8 billion people on this planet. In order for this to even come close to being a worthy prophecy, it would have to be to the point where a lot of people died. Billions. Depopulation anyone? But on account of the chosen ones, the saint, the elite, the elect, those days will be cut short. Look, ladies and gentlemen, 
what I'm trying to say is not me because these are not my words okay he says and these are the ones that come out of the great tribulation but the only reason why they can say salvation they owe to their God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb Okay, the only reason they could say that is because of the chosen ones. Because if it were not for the sake of the chosen ones, no flesh would survive. Well, these are the individuals, pay attention to what they say. I don't say that. They say it. Hold on, right here. Salvation we owe to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. They owe their lives. They have been saved. Because if it were not for the sake of the chosen ones, who are the chosen ones? Pay attention. He said to these angels, do not do any harm to the earth or to the trees until after we have sealed the slaves of our God on their forehead. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the sons of spiritual Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we know this is spiritual Israel? Let's go to Galatians. We're going to click there. We can go to Galatians 6.6 6, so that we'll make sure what Israel is talking about. And as for those who walk orderly of this rule of conduct, peace and mercy upon them, even upon the Israel of God. Well, who is the Israel of God? However, it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who descend from Israel are really Israel. This is the ninth chapter of Romans. He explains in the ninth chapter of Romans, that he is not talking about fleshly Israel. He's talking about spiritual Israel. That's why he speaks of circumcision of the heart and not of the flesh. What, you don't believe me? Ah, neither are those, neither are they all children because they're Abraham's offspring, rather, including Ishmael. What will be called your offspring will be through Isaac, not Ishmael. Okay? A lot of people believe that it's through Ishmael, but the scriptures didn't say that. Paul is quoting, and if you want to go and look at it, he's quoting Genesis 21, 12. Okay? He said that it was going to be through Isaac, not Ishmael. Says that is, the children in the flesh are not really children of God. So the fleshly Israel are not God's children. They're not the Israel of God. Because these are Israel's children. See? The sin from Israel are really Israel. So the children of the flesh are not the children of God. But the children of the promise, ah, Jesus promised that there would be chosen ones, individuals who would be chosen to rule with him in heaven are counted as offspring. Oh, snap. That makes a lot of sense. We're going to show you in a second. For the word of the promise was as follows. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. Not, not Hagar will have a son, but Sarah will have a son. Not only then, but also when Rebekah conceived two twins from one man, Isaac, our forefather. For when they had not yet been born, Pay attention, please. Most important part of the ninth chapter. For when they had not yet been born and had not practiced anything good or bad, so that God's purpose respecting the choosing may continue dependent, not upon works, but upon the one who calls, meaning upon God. It was said to her, Rebecca, the older will be the slave of the younger. Now, if you don't remember this, Rebecca asked to die because <laughs> they were fighting, the little boys were fighting inside her womb and causing her so much pain. And he says, for two nations are within your womb. Two nations, Islam and Israel. See, it already called, um, I'm sorry, not Israel. Uh, dang it, Edom. Sorry, Edomites. The Edomites. That's... Uh, Esau, I apologize, Esau, not Ishmael, the two nations, Ishmael, Ishmael was already prophesied to be a nation with Hagar, but this one was Jacob being a mighty nation, and now Rebekah having two children 
her children being nations. That's why Esau had 12 tribes. Jacob had 12 tribes. Both of them, 12 tribes. And it was said to her that the older will be the slave of the younger. Edom did become eventually subjected to the Israelites. Just as it is written, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau, or Esau I hated. Ladies and gentlemen, can anybody explain to me? Because I, I need to understand this. Here's another question. There's only one question for this video. Just want you to pay attention. He says, before they had practiced anything, right or wrong, pay attention. For when they had not yet been born and had not practiced anything good or bad, so that God's purpose respecting the choosing, he chooses those to whom he wants. You don't get to choose yourself. He does the choosing. Might continue dependent not upon works, but upon the one who calls. That's why we call them the called, chosen ones, the saints, the elect, the elite. He chooses them. Man does not get to choose them. Man does not get to call somebody a saint. This is his choosing. Anyway, that's why all of the saints are known as the 144,000. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, how I hope to be in that number when the saints go, they've always known this. They made songs about it, people. Okay, now let's, let's continue just for a brief. Not going to continue all the way. Wait, what are we going to say then? Well, wait, God said, Esau I hated, but Jacob I loved before they had done anything wrong? He said, so what, what is it then? Is there injustice with God that he does such a thing? <laughs> Certainly not. Where he says to Moses, I will show mercy upon those to whom I show mercy, and I will show compassion upon those to whom I show compassion. Wait, hold on. Do you know what happens when you show mercy to somebody? It's when you do something you don't have to do. Extending mercy is, is a gift. It's something that is not deserved. Well, the God of the Bible dominates the entire scriptures with the fact that he's able to read hearts and the intentions of man. He's able to discern what's in a man's heart. So before Esau was even born, he was able to discern what type of character this individual would become. And did not Esau prove to be exactly that? Before he had even been born, Esau, I hate it. Because what did Esau do the moment he did not get his way? Did he not go and do everything to piss off his mother and father? Go back and read the account. When he did not get his way, he cried. According to the scriptures, I think it's the book of Amos, with tears he cried. And Genesis, with tears he cried. And even the book of Acts, with tears he cried, hoping that somebody would feel sorry for him and give him something. And when he couldn't get his way, he did everything in his power to get back at his father and his mother his mother for siding with Jacob, his father for not giving him a gift and reserving something for him. He did everything to bring them pain and stress. That was Esau. So now you can see why Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. See, he says to Moses, I will have mercy upon whomever I will show mercy. And I will show compassion upon whomever I show compassion. So look, it depends not on the person who desires or on their efforts, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, and this, oh, you got to love this one. If you go back and look at the account of Pharaoh and let my people go, you'll find out that this is the reason why he allowed Pharaoh to keep being stupid. Why he did the ten plagues in the first place. Pay attention. For this very reason, I have let you remain to show you my power and connection with you and to have my name declared in all the earth. Did his name not get declared in all the earth with the Israelites being freed from Egypt? Now, nobody can deny that that event happened because that is history throughout the entire world. Every single country talks about it. Every single village and city knows of that situation. 
And they knew that it was the God of the Hebrews that caused that to happen. Again, he says, so then he has mercy upon whomever he wishes, but he lets whomever he wishes become obstinate. Did Esau not become obstinate? Did Pharaoh? Did it not say that Pharaoh kept hardening his heart? Could he not have made Pharaoh do what he wanted them to do? Well, he did it eventually, didn't he? So when you get a chance, just explain to me, because I know I just explained it a little bit, but just explain to me how he could hate one before they're even born. Now, when it used the word hate, it didn't mean that he had hated him because of him not being born, because of him being in the womb. He hated what he was going to do in the future. Now, you tell me if that, if that is wrong, if that is a mistaken understanding of this. Because it would go contrary to Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse 4 and 20, where it is a known fact that a son cannot be held accountable for the sins of the father. So if you have not committed right or wrong, you cannot be held accountable for not committing right or wrong, correct? Which is why Paul says, is there injustice with God? Okay? However, we commit right and wrong the moment we are born. The moment we're conceived because we're imperfect. Okay? So just tell me if that's the wrong understanding. I'd appreciate it. Now we got one more thing because we got to go back to uh, this young man's comment. Because like you see, it's a lengthy comment. He covers a bunch of things. And it has taken us an hour and one minute to cover this. So let's go ahead here. He says, which no man could number of all the nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches, palms in their hands. Palms. Okay. The 144,000 rose from the dead here. Ladies and gentlemen, the 144,000 doesn't don't come from the great tribulation. Go back and look. It says, a great crowd which no man was able to number. Well, in verse 4, that's verse 9. In verse 4, it says specifically, and the number of those sealed was 144,000. We can number those. Lord have mercy. So they're not the same group. Impossible. It says no man was able to number. See, look, this I behold, held, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Well, the other group, we can number. 144,000. He even puts the number here from the dead here. Then we got Matthew 27, 52. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints were split, or split, arose. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus didn't go to heaven until 40 days after his resurrection. Jesus didn't go to heaven until 40 days after his resurrection. <clears throat> Jesus didn't go to heaven until 40 days after his resurrection. So these graves that open could not have been individuals rising from the dead. But let's go to Matthew's uh, 2752. We're going to go to the Bible that he used. That's why he put the link there. Because, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to go to a YouTube. Uh-uh. We're going to go to the scriptures. Matthew's 2752. I don't want somebody on YouTube telling me. I want to see it from the scriptures itself. Because I don't want to go beyond what is written. Well, you're doing a video. Uh, yes, I'm doing a video, but I'm asking questions utilizing the scriptures, and I'm asking people to tell me, prove that it's wrong from the scriptures, not a YouTube video. Okay, I believe it was Matthew's 27:52, if I can remember. And we're going to put in 27 right here, because Matthew's a long book. 27. Well, technically it's only 28 chapters, but, you know, it's... Oh, and that's 52. Whew. Sorry. Well, I mean, because it's 52. That's a lot of verses. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to what's going on here. So we can see who these individuals who were... I want you to pay attention. Want, want to make sure who these people were. It says, and look, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two. From top to bottom. And this was a huge curtain. Okay, this went to the top of the temple ceiling to the floor. It stretched more than 50 feet. This was a huge curtain weighing a whole lot. It didn't fall to the floor. No, it was split in half. 
Okay, other scriptures say it was rent in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked. Pay attention. And the earth quaked. When you bury people, where, where do you put them? Do you not put them in the earth? Not everybody was buried in the side of a mountain like Jesus was. No, 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 because there weren't that many mountains. You know how many holes they would have had to put in? Eventually, there wouldn't have been no more mountains if they. No, people were buried in the grave. Lazarus and Jesus were buried in tombs because Lazarus was rich. Jesus was placed in the tomb of a rich person, Joseph of Arimathea, of the Sanhedrin. He was rich. That's why he had his own tomb quarried out of a mountain. So was Abraham and Jacob. That's why they could have a family tomb in the side of a mountain. Okay, it took a lot of work digging in the side of mountains back then. Go ahead, you try digging into a side of a mountain and see how long it takes you. So, these individuals were buried in the earth or ground. So, this was a great earthquake, not a simple earthquake. Notice this, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. This was a huge earthquake. Go look at California. I live in California, and I promise you I ain't seen no rock splitting during an earthquake. Okay? This was an earthquake so violent that rocks were split. And the tombs that were in those rocks and that were in the ground were opened. And many bodies of the holy ones, those holy ones who had died previously, because this is Jerusalem. And if you go and find out, the scriptures clearly say, and he was buried along with his forefathers. David was buried in the city of his forefathers. Those were the holy ones that they were talking about. Because the other holy ones had not been accumulated yet. They had not died yet because Jesus had not even been resurrected. So those holy ones are not these holy ones. Remember, Jesus was the first fruit. His resurrection amounted to the first fruit. So anybody who died before him could not have been a first fruit or even part of the first fruit because it would have to be everybody who died after Jesus since he was the first, not the last, the first. Okay, sorry and were risen up out of the grave. Were they risen to life? Was it a resurrection? That would be impossible because we have no indication in the scriptures of any of these individuals being resurrected back to life. David, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Jacob. We already found out in Revelation that they're resurrected to life on the earth. That's why they stand before the throne and that's why he leads them the fountains of waters of life. And people were coming out from among the tombs after his being raised up or excuse me and people coming out from among the tombs after his being raised up entered into the city because it was so violent that some of the bodies actually ended up in the city because the tombs weren't in the city okay and they became visible pay attention to many people. These are not spirits, ladies and gentlemen. These are the actual tombs. These are the actual bodies that ended up in the city because this earthquake was that violent. Now, hold on. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm reading into the scriptures. So, go ahead and show me a single scripture where it shows that these individuals were resurrected individuals. Because, hold on. This is Matthew speaking. He's going to talk about Jesus' resurrection, res 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 resurrection in the 28th chapter. He's going to talk about Mary, pay attention, not believing that it was Jesus. Or excuse me, not Mary, Thomas. That Jesus was resurrected. Why would Thomas find it so hard to believe that Jesus was resurrected if he had already seen all these other people resurrected? It says, and when the army officer and those with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw that the earthquake and the things happening, they grew very much afraid and said, certainly this was God's son. 
Why would they say that if they're just watching people come and risen from the dead? Wouldn't they be talking about that? Wouldn't that be the talk of the town? Would everybody be talking about that as opposed to Jesus is dying? If these people have been resurrected, that's a lot of people. Because it said many. That's a lot of people if they were all resurrected. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot to do with translation and how certain Greek words are translated. But then we can go with the context of the scriptures. Twice it said earthquake. And then it says down here, earthquake. And when these observers saw this, they didn't say, hey, wait a minute. Aren't you Elijah? Oh, man, I've been wanting to meet you. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. You know, I got first dibs on talking to Elijah. You see, that's what would have been going on. Nobody would have been worried about Jesus. Okay, nobody would have been worried about taking his body down or anything. Because remember, they could not leave the body hanging on that pole overnight. That's why they had to hurry up and take him down. Because it was a Passover night. It was a double Passover. Okay, that's why they called it a special Passover. Because not only was it the seventh day Passover... But it was also the Passover for the official Passover for Nisan 14. So it was a double Passover. Seventh day of the week and the actual Passover. That only happened every so many years. And so they were very much looking forward to keeping that celebration. Oh, well, look at that. But the rest of them said, let them be. Let us see if Elijah comes to save them. Well, since this is a re resurrection thing, since the people are thinking that these were resurrected bodies, well, should not the people have thought that Elijah had come back and somebody had written about it? Hold on. No, this is a very significant event, these people being resurrected. I mean, look at Lazarus. The whole Bible commits a whole chapter and seven verses to Lazarus just being resurrected. How come nobody else talks about resurrections? Of these individuals being resurrected. Look at that. And many women were watching from a distance. Who had accompanied Jesus to Galilee. To minister to him. And among them were Mary Magdalene. Mary the mother of James. And Joseph. And what do we find? The, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. But we don't find nothing about these people. Who are these? Well let me show you something real quick. And we're, we're over an hour. Sorry. But I think this is important because the individual is obviously thinking that these are resurrected individuals. So let me show you something real quick. We're going to go to John and we're going to go to the 12th chapter. Now, if you really want to find out what happens at death, go to John the 11th chapter. That whole chapter is dedicated to what happens to a person at death. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived in Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised up from the dead. So they spread an evening meal for him there, and Martha was serving them, but Lazarus was the one dining with him. And Mary took a pound of perfume oil. You guys remember the perfumed oil? Well, let me let you know what was so important about this event. Let's go here, because I need you to understand when people were resurrected, how important that was. Therefore, Jesus could no longer walk about publicly among the Jews, but he departed from there to the region near the wilderness. Why? Pay attention. Not only, this is what they said about Lazarus being resurrected, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, Do you not know anything at all? And have you not reason that it is to your benefit for one man to die in behalf of the people rather than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Why were they talking about this? Well, if you go to verse number 47, they tell you why. So the chief priests and the, the, chief priests and the Pharisees of the Sanhedrin gathered together and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, they will all put faith in him and the Romans will come and take both away our place in our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, why? Because all they were talking about was Lazarus. Said many of the Jews that had come with Mary and who had saw what he did put faith in him. 
Okay, they were only talking about Lazarus. Everybody was going over to Lazarus' house. Why? Because he had just been resurrected, and they wanted to see who this resurrected individual was. That's what's going on here when they're at Lazarus' house. All the people are there to speak about that. Why? Because they had not seen anything like that. Look, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews got to know that he was there, and they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the chief priest now conspired to kill Lazarus also. If all of these other individuals have been raised from the dead, where is the other scriptures talking about these individuals and their resurrection? That's the question. If that had indeed happened, since it was a significant event to where everybody came to see, how come we don't have a single scripture talking about any of those events? That's the first thing. Okay, so these were not the saints that are spoken of in Revelation. These are the saints that are of old, the ones that are spoken of in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Not all of them, some of them, because many of their bones were completely disintegrated by that time because it had been 3,000 years for some of them. Moses, Abraham, you know what I'm saying, Vern? Now, since they came out of the grave after his, no, it wasn't after his resurrection. This was before he was resurrected. This is the day he died. So pay attention. It says He says, and it came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. They, it wasn't after his resurrection. He hadn't been resurrected yet. He had just died. It was as a result of his death that the earthquake occurred. Okay, now hold on. Let's continue. Which city did they go to the earth Jerusalem or the heavenly city after Jesus rose from the dead heaven to his father because Jesus is the real high priest of Melchizedek he had waved the sheaf mentioned in Leviticus 23 ladies and gentlemen the city that they went to was not heavenly Jerusalem they did not get resurrected to heaven I mean they would have gone to heaven before Jesus Jesus didn't go to heaven until 40 days later, he had to remain. He stayed with the disciples. And just before he ascended, he appeared to the 500. We just learned that in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. These individuals could not... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. That's... I, I apologize. My fault. I'm talking. I should be showing you this. Okay? Hold on. When I say these individuals could not have gone to heaven, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to all publications. We're going to 1 Corinthians 15 again, because we were just there. Like I said, I, I don't need to explain away anything. I just need to show you what it says. You are the ones I'm asking to help me to disprove this. Because, man, if the scriptures don't say it, and we're all talking about scriptures. See, according to the scriptures, he was raised up on the third day. Well, Matthew's the 27th chapter, verse 52, 53, is the first day of his death. He was raised on the third day, so those individuals did not go to heaven. Do you know why? You don't know why? Well, we have to go to John. Many of you guys know John. Yeah, many of you guys know John. A lot of people know John. I always would tell people, a lot of people know of this scripture. You guys been to John, the third chapter? Now, a lot of people go to John 3, and they know 16. Some of them know 16 by heart. Matter of fact, some people have John 3, 16 tattooed on their arms, their forehead, their backs, everything, legs. They John 3, 16, do me a favor. Let's read verse number 13. Can, can somebody help me read verse number 13? Because 13 is so important. Because this is what I've been doing all this time. Is I've been focusing on this scripture. Moreover, no man or woman or holy person or saint or sinner or anybody has ascended into the heavens but the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. No one could have gone to heaven before Jesus. It was just not possible. Why? Because there was a rule. He would be the first fruit. The first, not the last, not the third, not the eighth. 
what would it look like somebody receiving that reward before him and he's supposed to be the leader of the group these are his 144,000 who rule with him as kings and priests what would it look like if one of them succeeded him even John the Baptist says that one must go on increasing while I go on decreasing so it would have been impossible for those individuals to have been resurrected prior to Jesus when the scriptures say it's impossible now we're not going to cover everything because it, it'll take too long because you know we've been it's been an hour and 20 minutes just covering the one comment and the Lord said to Moses saying speak to the children of Israel and say to them uh, come into the land that I'm about to give you the harvest see he's still thinking about the harvest okay we're not talking about the harvest the whole conversation was about who are those chosen ones and who are the great crowd that no one is able to number but then he highlights on the 50th day that's when the Pentecost happened but Jesus was resurrected on the, uh, and went to heaven on the 40th day but he confuses that by saying that he was resurrected and the other ones were resurrected at the same time and they went to heavenly new Jerusalem okay and I heard another number of them which were sealed and they that were sealed uh, let's see 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel again spiritual Israel we just confirmed that that's what Paul said now see a different offering a new one and look and lo the lamb on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father in their forehead uh, okay Jesus talking to Mary he says do not cling to me for I have not ascended to my father but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God okay when did Jesus go back to heaven I just said it several times he went back 40 days after his resurrection so reaching his finger says put your hand there in my side and stop not believing 144,000 is gone till Jesus coming no that's not true because he says the 144,000 is gone till Jesus coming again in the harvest of the wheat now the house of Ephraim and the great multitude which is the wheat among the tares of the last days ladies and gentlemen let's show you about the 144,000 whether or not they're gone because I think that that's an important point and I'm actually glad that it's brought up that he says the 144,000 are gone until Jesus return so let's take a look at something looking for a revelation so that's Galatians this is revelation and this is the seventh chapter let's I need you all to pay attention to something and I saw another angel ascending from the sunrise having a seal of the living God and he called out with a loud voice to the four angels whom it was granted to do harm to the earth so who causes the great tribulation it is God it is his angels that caused the great tribulation so do not think the great tribulation is caused by man he puts it into their hearts to carry out his one thought are you saying that he wants to depopulate the earth no he allows them to carry out that thought but that thought is going to bring forth his anger so that he destroys them why would he do something that don't make no sense because you have to understand who he is and how he acts that's why he gave us the scripture so we can understand his personality but that's another conversation for another time saying do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until after we have sealed the slaves of our God on their forehead and I heard the number of those who were sealed which means this is current not future 144,000 out of every tribe of the sons of Israel now remember this says out of every tribe of the sons of Israel hmm that's interesting again like I said it can't be the literal sons of Israel so let's go back to the original chapter that we brought forth the discussion in the first place Revelation the 20th chapter oh no 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 I'm sorry yeah cuz I gotta I gotta remember I didn't change it to Revelation over here I changed it to Revelation over here so I gotta go to Revelation 20 to zero um, 
says, and I saw an angel coming out of heaven, having the keys to the abyss, Jesus. Talks about the thousand years locking Satan up. Now I want you to know that this is not after Jesus' return. And I saw thrones and there were those who sat on them and authority of judging was given to them. And says who and those who sat on them were given authority to judge yes i saw the souls of those executed for the witness they gave about the christ and for speaking about god so the ones who sit on those thrones ladies and gentlemen are followers of christ not those who are before christ for these are the ones who had not worshiped the wild beast or its image which the wild beast doesn't come into existence until the last days and had not received the mark on their forehead or in their hand. Again, the last days. So it cannot be, follow me, it cannot be those who existed prior to Jesus. Not a single one. And the first resurrection, because that person is going to try to cover that as well. The first resurrection is this one. These individuals being resurrected to heaven, being bought from the earth. That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection, well, technically the Bible doesn't call it the second resurrection. It doesn't say second resurrection. It says, and they came to life. Okay? These individuals who were judged according to the deeds that they did were judged according to the scroll of life and what was written in it. Now, there were some people trying to explain to me about the lake of fire. Look, the lake of fire, it simply says it means the second death. This means the second death, the lake of fire. Verse 14, says that death and Hades were hurled into the lake of fire. King James Version used the word Hades. That's why you hear me sometimes say the word Hades. But that's what the footnote is, Hades. That's, that is the common grave of mankind. Death and Hades were hurled into the lake of fire. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get someone to... Help me understand that this is all wrong. Okay? That these thrones that these individuals sit on, that this is the 144,000. Wait a minute. Said they were set on thrones and these were executed for the witness they gave about Christ and for speaking about God. Okay, so that's 20. Let's go back to 14. Now, notice this. And I heard the sound of many waters in heavens, the sound of loud thunders, and the sound I heard was out of singers accompanying themselves on the heart. And they are singing what seems to be a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one's able to master that song. But except the 144,000 who have been bought or redeemed from the earth. Redeemed is like you do something with a coupon. Somebody purchased them. These are the ones who did not defile themselves with women. In fact, they're virgin. These are the ones who keep following the lamb no matter where he goes. In order for them to follow the lamb no matter where he goes, pay attention. In order them, for them to follow the lamb no matter where he goes, they would have to have existed after his existence. They would, you are the ones who have followed me. He said to Peter, come be my follower. He said to Andrew, come be my follower. These are the ones who keep following the Lamb. It could not have been anybody before him. And by the way, those of you who think John the Baptist could have been, well, John the Baptist died a little over a year, almost a year before Jesus died. So it couldn't have been John the Baptist. These would actually have to be followers. And because he is the first fruit, look what it says. These were bought... From among mankind as first fruits. Jesus purchased these with his life, his blood. Okay? That's why they are bought from the earth. Now, I, again, I'm not saying that. Go ahead and read the scriptures talking about Jesus being a ransom. Wait, hold on. R A N S O M. Yeah, I knew I did that. I, I told you I'm tired, and that's what happens when I'm tired. I, you heard me say N, and I hit M, okay? That's what happens when I'm tired. Happens, happens, happens. I, I want to go to, let's go to Romans, because Roman talks about the ransom. Okay, now, hold on. It is as a free gift that we are being declared righteous, the chosen ones, by his undeserved kindness, 
through the release by ransom paid by Jesus. So they were bought because of Jesus' blood. Wait, hold on. God presented him as an offering for perpetuation once and for all times through faith in his blood. His blood is what purchased them. Now, don't take my word for it, ladies and gentlemen. I am asking for someone to prove me wrong. You know, there is a way to go to the next one. Oh, I know what it is. Hold on. Let me see. There you are. Okay. Then he says it again. Waiting for adoption as sons. That's right. Adoption as sons. It says, not only that, but we ourselves also who have the first fruits, namely the spirit. These are spirit adopted sons. Yes, we ourselves grown within ourselves while we are earnestly waiting for adoption as sons. And release from our bodies by ransom. Interesting, ain't it? The scriptures don't contradict. They harmonize. They completely agree with themselves. Jesus bought the lives of all Christians when he gave his life as a ransom sacrifice. However, not all Christians belong to him in the sense that they die in Christ. As a result, Christians do not belong to themselves, but consider themselves to be Christ's slaves. Ladies and gentlemen, the 144,000 is of the same group. When Jesus said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, that chosen fold, these also I must bring, that's what he's referring to. Wait a minute. Hold on. We got one more because Paul speaks about the ransom more so than anyone else. Now, if you notice, he keeps talking about a release by ransom. Remember, those individuals were bought from among mankind. Bought from among mankind. All right. And I think that's going to be about it. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. Gone until Jesus comes again. Nope, we already covered that. Barley of the Passover have been and gone. The 144,000 have been and gone. Well, according to the scriptures, the 144,000 doesn't go anywhere until the angels have sealed the final one and then the destructive winds are released. Go back and read Revelation, the first, the 14th chapter, verse 1 through 4. Take my word for it. Next is the Jubilee time. Now, I want you to go and do me a favor. Find in the scriptures where Jesus speaks of a Jubilee. Go ahead. Show me one scripture where Jesus speaks of a jubilee because he's the one who gave us the prophecy concerning the last days. Go ahead and see if he says anything about a jubilee. He does say the great tribulation. Now, if you're talking about the time after the tribulation, of course, that's going to be a jubilee. But this person chooses a date. Uh, according to Jesus, nobody knows the day or the hour. This one says the 27th of March. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we just had a huge wind just blow through, a huge gust. And we do get those um, micro gusts, micro bursts that happens all the time. So that's that noise you just heard. And that one was pretty strong. I think that may have been about 40 to 60 miles an hour. The reason why I say 40 to 60, because I wasn't standing outside, so I couldn't feel the full effect. Okay. But I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of this wine or anything. He says that because it's the memorial of his death. Okay. The three and a half years start of the tabernacle. Three and a half years. Oh, he's bringing in Daniel. No, because that's, yeah, Daniel's the one who speaks about three and a half years. No, that won't work. Because you can't do it by those days. It, it uh... You can't do it that way because that's not how the, the days will add up, not even in our day. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first video, 58 minutes, this one, an uh, hour and 34 minutes, just responding to what someone says. Look, there are a lot of people out there who try to understand the scriptures without the scriptures. I don't. Did you notice that every single point that I brought up, I used the scriptures to prove my point? even taking a venture online to prove my point so what i am going to say is i'm looking for someone to disprove the information from the scriptures that's what i want to see now when i say i want to see i want to see if there is any such information 
can the Bible contradict itself? Or is it the fact that man has interfered with Scripture or has misinterpreted Scriptures or have thought that they could interpret Scripture? Watch this. I-N-T-E-R-P-E-T A-T-I-O-N B-E-L-O-N-G Yeah, I know I misspelled interpretation. I do that all the time. Um, I, I, I can't tell you. I'm too tired. Yeah, I'm too tired. Uh, hold on. There are only there are two verses or two situations in scriptures where it talks about interpretation belonging to God. One of them is well, technically, I think they're both in. No, one is in Genesis. The other one is in Daniel. Okay, and so the first one in Genesis. Uh, let's do G O D. I'll put that there first before I do Daniel. Let's go to Daniel first before I go. And click on that. O oh, Jehovah, to us belong the shame, to our kings and our princes and our forefathers. Uh, no, we don't want to belong the mercies. This is the ninth chapter. What we're looking for is in the fourth chapter. And why we're going to the fourth chapter is because Nebuchadnezzar, the king, says, At that time my understanding returned to me. So this is after he had been told the interpretation of his dream. And whose name was Belteshazzar? And I, you know what? It's Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Belteshazzar was Daniel. So I, I confuse that all the time. So I retract that information. Okay. Interpretation. Interpretation. Okay. So sorry. Interpretation. I say interpretation. So interpretation. The pronunciation, it's all about pronunciation. That's my fault. Okay. Says they were unable to make interpretation, interpretation. And because they weren't able to do it, they called Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, did not let the dream, or the king said, do not let the dream or the interpretation frighten you. Why? Because the first dream that Daniel foretells of this young man, the king threatens to kill every of the wise practicing people of the kingdom. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, may the dream apply to those hating you. Well, why is that? Well, let's find out about the interpretation. Let's find out why Daniel was able to interpret this dream. Notice what he says. Notice what they say of him. This is what the king says. But you are able to do so because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Interesting, ain't it? So, let's find out the interpretation and who gets to interpret. We're going to go to the second chapter. No, is it I think it's the third chapter. Yeah, because that's where... Nope, it's the second chapter. The third chapter is the three boys. Them, 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 them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ananias, Azariah, and Mishael. People say, where was Daniel during that period? Don't worry about where Daniel was. Mind your own business. Man, like they can't have a life. Okay, pay attention. Daniel replied to the king. None of the wise men or conjurers or magic practicing priests or astrologers are able to tell the king the secret that he is asking. But there is a God in the heavens who is a revealer of secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the final part of the days, in our day. Not in Nebuchadnezzar's day, in our day. This is your dream, and these are the visions of your head as you laid on your bed. Interpretation belongs to Jehovah. You guys don't believe me? I'm going to do it. 
I'm going, this is the last thing that I'm going to get off of this video and let y'all get on about. See how these conversations go, can go? C copy. Okay. V, I'm going to do interpretation belong to God first. We're going to do that first. Okay, now the first thing it should give me is Genesis. See? 49? No, not 49. Uh, 39. Nope, 40. Haha. <laughs> well, I knew it was right around 39. It's been a while. And the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt were confined in the prison, and each had a dream on the same night, and each dream had its own interpretation. In the morning, when Joseph, who was watching over them, he was put in charge of them, came in and saw them, they looked dejected. So he said, and he asked the officers of Pharaoh, who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces gloomy today? At this they said to him, We've each had a dream, but there's no interpreter for us. Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Relay it to me, please. Interpretation. So when you hear about people trying to interpret the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot interpret the scriptures. They're not designed for your interpretation. The scriptures say what they say. The scriptures don't contradict themselves. That's why I could ask a question. Can someone disprove this? Because I know for a fact that no one can. I know that for a fact. The only problem is, why do people believe in so many different things other than what the scriptures say? Why do they believe in things that contradict what we just talked about? I didn't tell you what I believe. I, I have not said one thing about what I believe. I've shown you like I've done on every video I've ever done, I've shown you what I'm talking about. I have demonstrated to you what it actually says. I do that with the law. I do that with everything. So my question to all of you is, why? Sorry, I have to undo this right here. My question to all of you is, why is it that there are so many people with so many different beliefs if it's just one book? If we're all reading from the Bible, does it matter if somebody has changed 600 verses of the Bible? The Bible doesn't contradict itself, so that's how you know they've changed it. Every time they put me in a situation where I didn't have access to the Bible of my choice, I still could use the Bible that was given to me because I understood where the changes were. I understood the Bible doesn't contradict itself, which is why to this present day, no one, and it's only been 24 hours, ladies and gentlemen, but nobody is going to be able to, because it's not possible, because the scriptures don't contradict themselves. That would mean that the true God, the one who inspired the Bible, whether you believe that or not, is not an issue, because you can't prove that he didn't inspire the Bible. Go ahead. Go ahead, I dare you to try to prove that he did not inspire the Bible. You cannot. So stop with the stupid arguments. You, you're just disagreeing with something because you don't like it. Because it doesn't fit your narrative. You, you People, you've got to stop that stupid stuff. Just because you don't agree with something doesn't mean that it ain't so. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't mean that it is not what it is. There are a lot of things I don't agree with. I promise you there are a lot of things I don't agree with, but that's doesn't have anything to do with anything. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I do have to go. I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, but as I said, it's okay. I'll leave the comments open, but there's no need for anybody to try to disprove any of this information because you saw where I got it from. Okay, even with the bodies, you know, like I said, show me where <laughs> anybody talks about those bodies as having done anything, as having witnessed or talked about where they were, where they were, or when they died. Because wouldn't that have been the interesting part? Oh, by the way, if they were resurrected and they walked among men, well, blood and flesh can't enter into heaven, so they would have to die again. So when when did they die? Of course, there was a funeral. Of course, there were people who documented it. What about Peter? Don't tell me about a book of Mary. The, I, I know people be talking about the book of Mary. There ain't no such book, ladies and gentlemen. Mary did not write a book. You know why Mary didn't write a book? Because in the scriptures, not a single book of the Bible is written by a woman. Esther, Ruth, 
and what Esther, Esther, Ruth, and who's the other one? I know there's another one. Well, people think Ezra is a woman, but Ezra is a man. He's a scribe. I think it is just Esther and Ruth. Uh, those scriptures named after women, those biblical books named after women were written by men. It's not because the Bible was chauvinistic. It's that the ones who were instructing the congregation, the Levites, the ones who took the lead, were men. That, that's the only way it could have been because that was the law. Can't sidestep the law. Sorry, it was the law. I know you don't agree with it. I know you, 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 you modernized and all of that. But it don't matter what you feel or what you think. We're not talking about how it is. We're talking about how it was. And so there are so many people trying to alter and add and create books and write books. People stop listening to those idiots. If you are a part of anything where they're not teaching directly what the scriptures say, walk away now. Don't, don't do yourself any favor by staying there because you're not doing yourself any favor. Sitting and listening to something that you know isn't true, that's why I'm going to stop listening to your videos. Anyway, sitting and listening to something that you know isn't true, you cannot take a little drop of poison and put it in a glass of water and say, here, drink it, honey. This ought to make you feel better. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth mixed with lies is always a lie. You cannot have the lies mixed with truth. There is no true God there because he's the God of truth. He cannot exist with the lie because final scripture... I'm going to just type it in here because we might as well get there. F-A-T-H-E-R of the L-I-E. Father of the lie is John, the 8th chapter, verse 44. But we're going to find out who this father of the lie is. Because if it is mixed with lies, that means it can't be the true God. If it is mixed with lies, that means it can't be the true God. Notice Jesus says the same thing. He said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I come from God and am here. I have not come of my own initiative, but the one who sent me. Or excuse me, but that one sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Ah, because you cannot listen to my word. You are from your father, the devil. And you wish to do the desires of your father. That one was a murderer when he began. And he did not stand fast to the truth. Because the truth is not in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks according to his own disposition. Because he is a liar and the father of the lie. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot be a part of any organization talking about the Bible. And they tell something that is not true. Because that means God is not there. Because the father of the lie is not God. It is the devil. And so if you are a part of an organization and they're not, and you know they're not teaching the truth, you know that that's not what they're supposed to be talking about, you know that they're teaching something wrong. Understand, God cannot be there. No matter how much you want to say, those are nice people. Oh, that no, that she's my friend. Okay, there were a lot of people who were friends during the flood. There were a lot of people who were friends during Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't take my word for it. Go back and read. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's the last point. Have a good day. This is just me responding to that uh, comment under the video. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Y'all take care. One hour and 49 minutes. This has been a marathon day. Gotta go.